and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand a staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. There you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it so that people may have something to drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place where this miracle occurred, Maza, which is Tess, and Meribah, contention, because of the call of the because of the quarreling of the sons of Israel and because they tested the patient of the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Did you want me to keep going? Yeah, let's stop there, sis. I appreciate you. That's a good place to stop. Did you have any comments, okay. comments from there? Oh, uh, I mean, not really other than it's like they keep repeating the same thing over just like last time with the manna they complain they curl with Moses again he's saying you know this is like I said like they're basically they they're doing it to Moses like I just you know what I'm saying but it's really to God who they're quarreling with and complaining to but they feel they're looking at it like it's Moses or whatnot and then the part that stuck out was the water, like, struck in it, and then it come out, and um, it just made me think, I don't know why, but it made me think of Jesus, like, when the water and the blood came out of the side, and, um, and also, like, also, it made me think about that's the story with the woman at the well. And she was like, you know, um, he, she was asking him, like, why would he ask a Samaritan or whatever for something to drink? But then he went on to say, like, if you basically, like, if you knew who you were speaking to, you would ask me for this, you know, this living water. Because once you drink this living water, like, you won't ever be thirsty ever again. That well water, you'll be thirsty but the water that I give you, you won't ever be thirsty again. So that's what made me think about Christ. Hallelujah. Beautiful, beautiful comments. What else y'all got? Come on, y'all. What y'all got? What y'all got? Um. Okay, y'all. Well. Um. So they. It says that they moved the whole community. Get in here. Oh. Hold on one second, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so the um I'm sorry. So yeah, they moved to so they they left where they were at and they they're going to a place called Rephidim. Okay, Rephidim means um in Hebrew a place of rest, like a rest stop or whatever. Okay. So let's just keep that in mind, okay? But remember their whole entire journey. They left Egypt and they're on their way to the promised land. They're on their way to Canaan, right? The land that God promised 
Abraham. Because remember, do we got to go all the way back? Y'all remember God freed Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. That was the promise that he gave to Abraham. Remember, that was the covenant that he made with Abraham. And so now they're on their, they're out of Egypt. They're on their way to Canaan, to the promised land, to that land that God promised the descendants of Abraham. Okay. Now, like Sister Erica just said, they're they're groaning and complaining yet again. They literally just left the the um you know the place where he showed them the manna and the the quail. Now, mind you, they're they're eating this manna the whole time that they're in the wilderness. This was not just a one time experience. Okay, from then on, it's not a one time experience. Now, remember, remember, y'all. I almost forgot. I had to go back and take a glance because I almost forgot, y'all. Remember the they had bitter water. Remember, he turned the bitter water sweet. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's go all the way back. First of all, let's go back to the 10 plagues, okay? All the miracles there that they seen. He just parted the Red Sea. They haven't even been out of uh, Egypt a good two months, I don't believe. It's really a short period of time, y'all. It's just a, some weeks, y'all. It's not like it's been two years, five years or whatever. So all of this is just still brand new, okay? So the, the part he parts the Red Sea. He turns the bitter water where they were complaining that the water was too bitter to drink. He turns the bitter water to drinkable water, okay? They see the manna and the quail just comes out of nowhere. So they have bread and meat to eat, right? And now they're here at Rephidim and the, um, they're... Um, there's no water. And so they're literally thirsty again. Their flesh, their flesh, like the body wants water. You know what I mean? They're thirsty and they feel like they're dying of thirst, right? And so they start complaining again against to Moses and grumbling against Moses. And notice that this time it says that Moses says, um, Moses goes and cries out to God and Moses says, you know, um, that he said, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. So do y'all think that Moses was exaggerating? Or do you think that that was a true statement that the Israelites were so upset and so, um, mad and angry that they were literally ready to stone Moses, the one, the prophet, the mouthpiece of God, the one who's been standing in the gap for them, the one who has come in the name of the Lord and led them out of captivity. Are they really truly? And the one who struck, who's showing the hand, the hand, the power in the hand of God, like striking the, um, the water, turning it from bitter to sweet. Like, are they, are, are they really ready to kill him? Is their flesh rising up that much? Is the war against the flesh so much that they're that thirsty? I mean, we give them the, you know, that they are in the desert. I'm sure it's hot out there or whatever. They haven't, you know, they're thirsty. I get it. But are they to the point where they're ready to kill Moses? What y'all think? I feel like they could be. Um, I feel like both sides, though, like look at it from both sides. Maybe because like you said, because I was going to get back on here and say the same thing that was good. You know how our flesh do like we're used to eating, you know, we're used to having drinks. So when we don't for a couple of days, I mean, you get thirsty. You know what I'm saying? So let's not forget, we probably would have been doing the same thing. So maybe they, you know, maybe look, they could have had stones in their hand, you know, like, what is this? You don't want us to drink or whatever you know with the stones actually in their hand or just because of how they were saying it because you know how we get in that feeling too of when somebody say something to us or how they just present themselves and come at us it can feel like you know they might not have any stones in their hand but they're so upset angry it's like they ready to stone me at any minute you know so I just see it like both ways because it don't really tell us, but that is a good point. Well, when I thought about it, <clears throat> I was thinking about it more of like a spiritual level. Like it probably was like trying to like break his spirit. You know what I'm saying? Because Moses, he was sent to, um, you know, deliver people and everything like that. So it was probably sent to break his spirit from doing what he was called to do. So, yeah, that's what I got for me.
Hallelujah. That's a good point, um, um, Sister Aja. That's a really good point because I didn't even look at it from that aspect too. So that's good. Now let's look at let's look at a couple of scriptures that talk about complaining. If y'all got your Bibles, hopefully somebody got your Bible. Somebody pull up Philippians 2 and 14. Somebody pull up, that's Philippians 2, 14. Somebody pull up Numbers 11, 1 through 3. Numbers 11, 1 through 3. And somebody pull up 1 Corinthians 10, 10. 10 10. I have Philippians 2 14. Hallelujah. If you could read it for us, please. And most of the brother and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Is that the right one? Hold on, unless maybe I wrote it down wrong. Hold on. But let me let me see. Hold on. Who else got one? Does, does somebody else have numbers? Um, numbers 11, 1 through 3. I can see numbers, but my Philippians, my Philippians 2, 14 says, do everything without murmuring or questioning the providence of God. So that's 2, 14. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You said numbers. Yeah, yeah. And that's so it's it's telling us to do everything without murmuring or complaining, right? That was Philippians 2 14. Okay, yes, please. Numbers 11, 1 through 3. One through yeah, one through three. It says, now that people became like those who complain and whine about their hardships, and the Lord heard it. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and devoured those in the outlying parts of the camp. So the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire died out. He named that place Tabera, the place of burning, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Wait a that minute. Was now, sister, did, you want did you just read that the fire of the Lord came because of their complaining and grumbling? that's what it said okay all right now let's go somebody read first corinthians 10 10 i'm talking to myself y'all i'm talking i ain't no saint now i'm talking to myself all right first corinthians 10 10 first corinthians 10 10 hold on one second Okay, here we go. And do not murmur in unwarranted discontent as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Okay, now if we read this whole part in context, Paul is talking here about this journey that they had in the wilderness. And he's talking about the whole entire journey from start to finish. And there's so many examples of their complaining that they did from the time they left Egypt all the way up until um, the Israelites, the next generation entered into Canaan. Okay. It's so many examples and the judgment of God did come because of their murmuring and complaining. So we do see grace. But we also see judgment as well. So let's not forget that. But I, I just wanted to point that out of just some of the things of places that it does talk about the murmuring and complaining. Because just because God continuously does provide for them, even in the midst of their murmuring and complaining, there is a judgment that also they have been, they will, they face because of it. Now, and remember, Paul is saying here in Corinthians. First Corinthians 10, 10, that these, these things were recorded, this, their journey and their sin and their rebellion and all of this stuff was recorded. So that way we can um, read it and see it as an example of what to do and what not to do. So, you know, the, the, they are our example of what not to do. Right. And so um, what do y'all think about, what do y'all think about the complaining aspect of it? Mm. It says, um, do everything without grumbling and or arguing. Um, it's so easy to um fall fall subject to complaint. Like I feel like it just becomes 
it can become a behavior. You get what I'm saying? Like, well, it's just, yeah, just like how you're saying. It can become, you know, it can become something that you just pick up naturally. And um, I think it's important to just find a safe place, you know, to to come to God and worship and to release, you know, everything. Because um, if you're grumbling and arguing, you know, you may need a release somewhere else on a on a deeper level. So I think it's important to pay attention to what your your spirit is really crying out for or asking for and take it to God because that's just kind of like saying that you can handle it on your own, but you really can't. And it's showing. Can I just share a scripture, Matthew 12? Matthew 12, 36 and 37. And this is something that, that will kind of get you all the way together with all this murmuring because we're guilty of it. I repent all day long. I say stuff never like, oh, Lord, forgive me. I mean that because you, you do. But Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So right there, that's it in a whole nutshell. Like, watch your mouth, you know. Um, he already told us that death and life is in the power of the tongue, you know. He already told us that you can't do curses and blessings. And, I mean, it's all kind of scriptures that that minister to our mouth, the tongue is the, the you know, the, the tongue is a small matter, but, you know, it, it can get you in a whole bunch of trouble. So it, it's best to just shut up and don't say nothing sometimes. Elder, elder, don't go nowhere. Don't go nowhere. Now, look, look, this stuck out to me. Now, what you just said, by your words, you shall be justified and by your words, you shall be condemned. Now, let me, let's look at what they said right here. Don't go nowhere, elder, please. Okay. Look, it says, um, where they started complaining, right? And they were grumbling against Moses. He, they said to him, they said, hold on. What did they say? Y'all help me find that verse where they started talking to Moses and they said something about, you know, them dying in the wilderness. Or did you bring us here to kill us or something? What verse was that? Hold on. Oh, I'm in the wrong day going chapter. That's why I can't find it. Hold on. What what verse was that, y'all? It was three. Three, it okay. three or four. Okay. Three. Ah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, let me read it. In, in my version, it says, but tormented by thirst, they continue to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us? Our children and our livestock with um, our children and our livestock with thirst. Now, if you remember last chapter, let's find it. Let's go back to 16. Last chapter, they said something about killing us or dying in the wilderness as, as well, too, didn't they? Or am I mistaken? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's find it, y'all. Let's find it. Go back to 16. Let's find it. Yeah, it, it's verse three again. Wow, no coincidence, y'all. It's verse three again, last chapter. It says, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us to death. Okay, listen, they keep talking about how, oh, we should have just died. Oh, we should have just got killed. We should have just, would you bring us here to kill us in the wilderness? Because they just moaning and complaining. They unsatisfied. Nothing is making them happy. So on and so forth. They keep forgetting the deliverances they keep forgetting everything that god has done so on and so forth they keep saying that thing about dying y'all there's many times more that they say it but think about this they have left egypt and they're on their way to canaan to the promised land but guess what if we go to the book of joshua where they are about to enter the promised land it says that nobody from this generation that left out of egypt made it into the promised land that they all died in the wilderness So that goes to, by your words, you'll be justified or by your words, you'll be condemned because they were seen as unfaithful, ungrateful, complaining, murmuring. I mean, it, when we go through this, I mean, you're just going to see they were just wrecks. 
I mean, they were murmuring, they were coming against Moses. They were, you know, even his own sister and brother at some point come against him. So, um, yeah, we have to watch our mouth. You know, you you can you can curse yourself. You can curse. That's why, uh, y'all, we gotta watch what we say. Cause you can curse your family. You can curse yourself. Like, let me tell you something. Uh, I'm gonna give you. A, I'm gonna give. I'm be transparent. I'm be real transparent right here. Y'all know I adopted a son, and he was bad from from the jump. When he, I mean, when he he was bad, just period. And I used to always say, "This boy gonna end up in jail." God help me, this child gonna end up in jail because I don't know what to do with him, and he either gonna end up in jail or he gonna end up dead. Because he's out of control. He's just bad. He's just, just all of that. Well, y'all know where he at. You know? So, and I repent for that all the time. Because I said, I could have spoke life over that child. But because in my frustration and in my flesh, I spoke what I thought I was seeing. So, yeah, y'all y'all go ahead. Watch your mouth. That's all I say. Watch your mouth. Just shut up. If you can't, if you can't say what your mother used to tell you, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. I'm so serious. I'm so serious. This is just convicting me all over again. And it's making me really, really, really want to just guard my tongue and watch what I say, because think about it. God had a whole entire plan. He came and delivered them out of Egypt to take them into the promised land, into Canaan, a land filled with milk and honey, a place of rest, a place where everything would be given to them. Like they wouldn't have to worry about anything. That was the land that he promised to Abraham. That's where they were on their way to, but they spoke death so many times over themselves and grumbled and complained. It changed the whole trajectory. None of them, the Bible says, none, no, none of them from this generation made it into the promised land, y'all. Joshua. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Because they were the only two that had a good report. Not even yeah. Moses made it in. Because it, they caused Moses to sin. And Moses, he saw the promise land, but couldn't even make it in. Come on, y'all. When, when I heard Moses didn't make it in, when I tell you I got scared, I got, you know what I'm saying? Whoa, come on, y'all. The grumbling and complaining changed the whole trajectory. They keep talking about dying and they died in the wilderness. That was not God's plan, though. That was not his plan. All right, what y'all got? What y'all got? Yeah, that wasn't his plan. And I think um, just seeing this grump, this quarreling and stuff also shows the self-righteousness as well. Because we haven't made it there yet, but in um, chapter 27, you know, the Lord asked them, would they be able to do all these things? And they, with their self-righteousness, complained and said that they could. And then after that, that's where the Ten Commandments came out. So, yeah, they just, like you said, it wasn't the plan. And if they just could have, you know... Uh, look to the Lord. <laughs> That's all I can say. I think God gave us a, a beautiful scripture to take all that to him, you know, and his word, you know, come to him, tell him about it to him, you know, so so he can direct you and, and lead you on what you need to do. I feel like that just goes to show that manifestation works on both ends, right? Because life and death, you get what I'm saying? It was like two scales. And they was like filling with their words, you know, they was bringing, you know, death into their life. You get what I'm saying? So that was just crazy to me. And, um, I remember when I was in high school, um, God, he kept telling me to manifest, start. He kept telling me to start speaking you know, certain words over my life, you know, because they manifest, they bring forth um, things in your life. So, you know, God give you, you know, that's, that's power, power in your tongue. Give it a fan. So it's just what they chose to use. It's whatever you choose to use it for.
Hallelujah. Anybody else got anything? Hallelujah. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this. Uh, now Moses goes and takes. Let me. Let me. Let me get my Bible. Hold on. Hold on. Because I want to look at it verbatim. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. So, cause again, they're thirsty, right? So Moses is giving, God is giving Moses instruction, right? He says, take your staff. Now, why does he say, take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile? Why does he say that? Look what he says. He's very specific. He could have said, take your same staff that you used to, you know, turn the water from bitter to drinkable or to sweet or whatever. But he says, take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock of Mount Sinai, strike the rock and water will come gushing out then the people will be able to drink. Why do you guys think that he specifically referred to the to the staff in that manner? He said the one that you used when you struck the Nile. Do you guys remember what happened when he struck the Nile, when Moses struck the Nile? I don't remember. Can you tell me? <laughs> uh, remember when he struck the Nile, y'all, that's when he turned the water of the Nile to blood. That was one of the plagues. He turned the water to blood. Remember the Nile was uh very important to their to their living right because the, the water it was a body of water it brought life it, it, it you know to to everything so he struck it and turned god struck it through moses turning the water to blood so the water was then undrinkable it was undrinkable right which then killed you know the the everything in the water and so on and so forth whatever okay so that was judgment that strike was judgment so God is saying, take that same staff that was used for judgment on the wicked and strike this rock. Now, why does he use the word strike? Strike to me is violent, right? To me, the way I'm hearing it, it's, it's a violent word. He could have said, just tap the rock. He could have even possibly said, hit it. But he said, strike it. Remember, and isn't that what it says, Genesis 3.15? He said when he, when Jesus, I mean, when God was prophesying, um, he said, the coming of Jesus in the garden of Eden for their sin. And he said that I will, um, he said that he's going to put enmity between the seed of Eve. And, um, and he said, I will, um, he said, how did it, I don't, don't want to quote it wrong. Y'all help me. He said, um, you will strike his heel, but G the seed will strike your head. Talking is talking about Satan's head strike, right? Well, some versions say bruise, right? But that's what we're talking about here. It's that striking, like sister Erica said. So you, so the, the rock is Jesus. We know that the rock is Jesus because of course, Jesus is our rock, the rock of our salvation, right? Jesus is that cornerstone. We know him to be the rock or whatever. And we know that according to what Paul said in, uh, first Corinthians chapter 10. If we go back and we read that again, let's go back. Let's pull up first Corinthians 10 for uh, first Corinthians 10. Does somebody still have it? I need to have like three, four Bibles open over here. I only got one at the moment, but I need to have more than one. So I don't have to keep flipping, but first Corinthians 10 and, um, 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 okay. It says, I'm gonna go to verse. Hmm. I'm gonna start at one. Okay. I'm gonna just start at one just for the heck of it. But I want you guys to ingrain this particular scripture in your head because Paul references it. It's so many, it's referenced here so many times. It goes back to everything that we're reading, but it's first Corinthians 10. It says, I don't want you to forget dear brothers and sisters about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud. We talked about that cloud being Jesus that moved ahead of them and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. We talked about that. All of them ate the same spiritual food and all of them drank the same spiritual water for they drank from the spiritual rock 
that traveled with them and the rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. But anywho, so so God tells Moses to get this, this uh, the go pick up that rod. This is the same rod that he parted the Red Sea with, the same rod that's been performing these miracles, that same strong power and authority of um, God. But he tells him to pick up this rod, but this time he refers to it as this rock of, of this rod of judgment. And he wants him to take this rod of judgment and strike that same rock, strike this rock representing Jesus Christ, strike him on the cross the way they did on the cross. And then water will pour out. And that's why Sister Erica said, I don't know why, but I'm seeing Jesus here because that's exactly what we're having. You were seeing the cross. You were seeing Jesus being struck by that rod of judgment, the judgment of our sin, the, the, the what we deserve being put on Christ. And then the water flowing from his side. We remember we talked about the blood and the water. This is showing the water, the Holy Spirit being poured out for them to drink, that we can drink, okay? And then out of our belly will flow rivers of flowing water. What y'all got? Yeah, you said it already, but as you was talking about the striking the judgment, it made me think even more like just a picture of Christ, you know, taking you know, all our stuff upon itself, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it just, it all, like, like we keep saying, it all points to Christ. It's all a picture of Christ, what he was doing, what he came to do, what God, you know, had him come to do. So, um, yeah. And the striking just reminded me of, like you said, with them, you know, when they whooped them, you know, with those things just tearing off the flesh, you know, I think if we really look at it, you know, just, well, we couldn't even imagine. Mm -hmm. We cannot even imagine. Like, even when we try to, you know, I sit here and I think, you know, the flesh is, is, is coming off. That's, you know, our condemnation, our sin, our shame, you know, our pity, you know, just, just everything that's not, of God, he just took it upon himself for us. And uh, we wouldn't even be able to bear that cross. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 You're right, sis. It, it all points to Jesus. And it's just so amazing and beautiful how it's all... Um, foreshadowed how the all the very details that just come together and fit together it's just so beautiful and so profound to me um and let's look at the fulfillment of it in the new testament because we're in old testament right but let's look at the fulfillment of an old testament and i know elder this is your favorite book right here we're going to john john 7 y'all let's go to john 7 37 through 39 John 7, 37 through 39, it says, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his belly. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. I think it's beautiful too how Christ, you know, how God was just so patient with them, just like he is with us now. He's just, you know, so patient. Um that's I, I, we just can't understand this thing we just I don't like I said we really understood yes you know what I'm saying he's a judge he is and he's coming back to judge however as believers he's our father the one with unconditional love towards us the one that died for us the one that stood up for us the one that was rose for us the one that came in our place the one, the one that's for us. And I think when we really feel, when we really realize that, you know, we can't be in the presence of God, encounter God, not that we're not in the flesh, that not that we're going to mess up, but we won't stay there. We won't stay there. Pigs stay in the mud. 
sheep lamb don't. They going to wash off. I, it's just it's just all beautiful and I still can't you know it's still just fresh revelation for all of us <laughs> like daily and also you know how he I mean just you know they they quarreled and they complained I mean just like us today and guess what like I said God was so patient guess what he sent them a reminder and he did it again he did it again over and over and over and over and over he did it again so he's just beautiful like ah, who wouldn't want this father come on be my daddy yes there's a scripture that says grace grace upon grace Grace upon grace. Hallelujah. One thing I just wanted to, we're going to get ready to move on to, to eight. And then when we go to eight, we could take it all the way down and we're going to finish that. But one thing that I did want to point out too. So when Moses, it says that Moses, uh, when he, uh, it says hold on. it says that Moses oh on verse 7 it says Moses named the place Masa which means test and Meribah which means arguing because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying is the Lord here with us or not and I just wanted to know what your guys' take was on how they tested the Lord, because Moses said that not only are you just complaining and you're arguing, but you're testing the Lord. And I wanted to know what your guys' understanding and commentary on the testing part. How did they test the Lord? Are you God or not? Are you able or not? Are you our deliverer or not? We going to die out here or not? Did you say who you are? Are you who you say you are? Like, if you all that, I mean, just think about it. If you all that, then why are we out here with no water? Come on, y'all. If you all that, why are we hungry? And then they start complaining about the manna after a while. They're going to be like, I'm tired of eating manna. Y'all, come on continually testing God. That's how they tested him. By not having faith and by directly challenging his authority and his righteousness and his holiness. The arrogance of it all. They were very arrogant in their hearts. On top of being murmurers and complainers, Thank you. So are these the same people that um that were like about to stone Moses? Oh, that's how I feel like they tested God. Because they were um using what he sent as uh something like if you gave God really sent you, let's see if he saved you from these stones. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So yeah, that was funny. But that's how I that's how I kind of feel like they tested God. Hallelujah. That was good too, Aja. That was good. Yeah, I didn't think of it like that either. And Elder Marie, that was really good. And I was trying to put what you were saying too into perspective, Elder, because it would be like, I was trying to picture like if it was my, my kids, you know, like say if I told my kid I was going to get him a car. And then, you know, I didn't get it yet because maybe I was still working on my money or, you know, trying to rearrange some things or whatever. And then you just keep coming to me like, where my car at? You said you was going to give me a car because it's the attitude of the heart, too, because it, like you said, when you said the arrogance, you know what I mean? It's the attitude of the heart. If he just came to me and was just was like, well, mom, do you think, you know, you can when do you think you'll be able to get the car because I really need it because I got, you know, trying to do this or that, you know, just through her humbly, you know what I mean? Then that would have been one thing. But then it's just like, but when you come into me like you said you was going to do it. Are you going to do it or not? Like, what's up? 
you know, you got me out here just catching the bus. You know what I mean? And so that would make me be like, hold on, bro. you like, you don't know nothing about what I'm doing, what I got going on, you know, whatever, whatever. So I, that was good how you explained. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, y'all got any last comments before we go on to the last part? So, yeah, so just to elaborate on how I feel like they was using, um, how they was using, what was the word again? How he was, how they was using Moses as a, um, as a way to test God was just like to see if, um, well, if you believe him so much, he should show up for you and maybe we'll see you know, him come through for you and then we'll believe he come through for us. But the way they was going about it was what I feel like was the test instead of actually using faith and trust. Hallelujah. That's right. That's good. That's exactly right. And like, I think Sister Erica is the one that said, or maybe Elder said it, that it, it's a pattern. Like they have this pattern. You know what I mean? Man, man, man. You know, I need to think about my patterns. Seriously. All right, y'all. Let's go to verse eight. Sister Erica, you could read verse eight and just take it all the way down to the end. If you want to continue reading. I'm sorry. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Then Amalek and his people came and fought with Israel at Ref Refidim. <laughs> So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek and, and his people. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So jo Joshua did as Moses said and fought with Amalek and Moses, Aaron, and her went up to the hilltop. Now, when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he lowered his hand due to fatigue, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and he grew tired. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Then Aaron and her, I think I'm saying that right, held up his hands one on one side and one on the other side so it was that his hands were steady until the sun set so Joshua overwhelmed and defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword the Lord said to Moses write this in the book as a mem a memorial and recited to Joshua that I will utterly wipe out the memory of Amalek and his people from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner, saying, the Lord has sworn, and oh, the Lord will have war against the people of Amalek from generation to generation. All right, sis, you got any comments? Uh, no, not really. Other than what we were talking about, um, I mean, it's just beautiful to see, um, you know, basically, as Moses' hands were, um, being held up, like, you know, they would win the fight. Um, I don't know. I see that as the cross too. I see that as the cross. Um, yeah, just Jesus' hands being stretched out. Victory is won. I'm not sure, but help, help us now. Help us. <laughs> Anybody else got any comments? We're going to come down. We're going to get there, Erica. We're going to get there. Anybody else got any comments? Um, you know that, again, with the staff and the staff um, representing that authority and that power, and every time he had that power raised up, you know, it was lifted up, then they were um, defeating Amalek and 
the Amalekites. But when he got weary, when he got tired and his arms came down, and that's when he had to have help. But this is the thing. God always sends help when you need it. This is one, one way to look at it. Some of these battles we fight and we feel like we by ourselves, but God will send somebody to help you in your time of struggle, to help you metaphorically hold your hands up to defeat the enemy and whatever struggle that you're dealing with in your life. We don't always have to go through these things by ourselves. We don't always, you know, we don't always have to do it alone. And that's something that that I feel like um, we do. Another thing was the Amalekites. They were cowards because you know how they came to fight them? They After they had passed through, they came from behind them to want to fight them. Ain't that just like the devil? Ain't he a coward? Don't he always come and try to get you on the low, try to get you when you off guard and still God provided for them to overcome and overtake them. And because they came backhanded like that, that's why they were um, wiped off. Not just them, y'all, but their whole generation. So that means to this day, there are no Amalekites left because they were utterly wiped off and destroyed because of the way that they tried to overtake um, the children of Israel. God protects his own. I know it's a lot of t-shirts out here now that say, uh, God don't play about me. Well, God definitely don't play about his chosen people. So I'm gonna leave y'all to the to the breaking down, but that's, that's just what stuck out to me. You don't always have to go through these things by yourself because God gonna send you help and watch your back. Because the enemy is a coward. And he tries to sneak up from you. Sneak, sneak up on you from behind so he can overtake you. Hallelujah. Thank you, um, Elder. Thank you. Anybody else got any comments? I'm going to read Deuteronomy 25. This is what Elder is talking about. Um, Deuteronomy 25, 17. Mo while they're in the wilderness at a later point, Moses mentions to them and, and refers back to this moment when the Amalekites attack them. It says, this is what Moses says about that attack. He says, never forget what the Amalekites did to you as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary and they struck down those who were straggling behind they had no fear of God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land, he is giving you as a special possession. You must destroy the Amalekites and erase their memory from under heaven. Never forget this. Because like Elder said, it was a sneak attack. They came from behind and snuck up on them. And he and they snuck up on them for the people that it says the ones that were straggling, the ones that were exhausted and tired. Most likely, a lot of the ones that were behind may have been like the elder, elderly, and maybe the um, you know, the ones with children, women and children, you know, or the ones that were just literally weaker or whatever. So he came and he struck and attacked the. They came and struck and attacked the vulnerable the weak, the stragglers, right? And it made me think like, man, I don't I don't want to be a straggler in the body of Christ, right? The vulnerable one where the enemy comes. Because remember, they have to band together. We got to be in unity. But if Satan can find a, 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 a vulnerable point, then that's where he'll come in and attack. And you know, Elder, we and you and I were just recently talking about that when we were talking about those one accord prayers and those praying in covenant and walking in, in covenant and stuff like that, walking in those covenant prayers. And if Satan can find a weak point, a weak link, like like what was that movie that that show that used to be out in back in the day, the um survivors, you know what I mean? The the weakest link, you know what I mean? That's where Satan will attack, right? But so so yeah, and doesn't that isn't that what Satan does? But the the unique thing about this, if we when we look at this battle at first glance, we could we could miss this point. And this is a very important point too, y'all. That the Amalekites, let's let's talk about for one second who the Amalekites are. The Amalekites are um the Amalekite Amalek, okay? They come from the Amalekites come from Amalek. Amalek is the grandson of Esau 
Remember Esau and Jacob were the two twins in the mother in Rebecca's womb. Remember the Bible says that there was going to be a war between nations, nation against nation in, in her belly. And remember that e the Bible says that Esau, God said, Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. So it was the descendant of Esau, the grandson, Amalek, in which this bloodline came from, the, the Amalekites, okay? That's important because they represent the flesh. Because remember, Esau is the one who gave up his birthright due to the flesh. Remember, he sold his whole entire inheritance, his birthright for a bowl of soup because he was hungry and he he straight up had no regard and no care. He said, what is that birthright going to do for me later on? And I'm hungry now. So he sold his birthright. He gave up everything for a bowl of soup to feed his flesh, to please his flesh. So the Amalekites represent this, um, the flesh. And so that's why the flesh, that's why when Satan comes in, that's why they say the flesh is, 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 is the playground for the enemy because, and that's why when the enemy came to attack, he attacked that vulnerable place, those weaker places. And that's what happens in the flesh. The enemy is able to attack the weak points in the flesh, those places where he knows that we're struggling with, and he's able to send in, you know, um, and, and, and come in and have a foothold in those places. So as we look at this whole, and mind you, I believe now when we, when you see where, where this starts, it says Israel defeats Amal the Amalekite that's on verse eight um it says it says it starts with then so whenever you see something that starts with like therefore or then or meanwhile you have to know what happened before that it means that it goes together this is not just a new a new story this is actually going with the original story and I don't think that it's coincidence that this battle that we're seeing here is an illustration of the of the of the battle against the consistent flesh that keeps rising up that we keep seeing in Israel, right? So I don't think that it's a coincidence by any means. Okay. And and I truly believe that this is um the illustration that really is supposed to be shown here because it was just a series of things that you know I was taken to 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 come to this um understanding. But I, I find it to be very, very profound. And then, but like Elder was saying, um, with the Amalekites, you know, God has said, remember, he says here at the, at the end, I think of the chapter that he says, he says, they have raised their fist against the Lord's throne. So now the Lord will be at war with the Amalek generation, generation after generation. Now, remember this, um, these Amalekites are the same Amalekites that if you remember the story, like with so King Saul and God uh, sent, he sent King Saul and the army in to go and kill the Amalekites. And he said, kill everyone, men, women, children, cattle, everything, livestock, everything. And Paul, Saul, I'm saying Saul did not listen and he let some of them live. And so he let the king live and I forgot the king's name, but anyway, he let the king live and he disobeyed God. And that's when God, when Paul, Saul, I'm sorry, Saul began to, um, he disobeyed God. So then after, after that, because he did not listen, we see later on, these Amalekites are still there. And that's where Haman came in at. Remember, Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites that were trying to kill the Jews in the book of Esther. So, um, I'm sorry, y'all. So that we're trying to kill the Jews in the book of Esther. So, um, so yeah, but like uh, Elder said, you know, God said that he was going to do away with these Amalekites and he did just like he's going to do away with his flesh. We're going to take off corruptible and put on incorruptible, right? And remember in Deuteronomy, it says how um, the flesh, how these Amalekites had no regard for God. They were totally against God. What did it say? What did it say? Hold on. It said... Um, it said, they had no fear of God. Therefore, when the Lord, your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land, he has given you a special possession. So it said that the Amalekites had no fear of God. And remember it, what it says about the flesh. The flesh is in constant enmity to God. The flesh cannot be subject to the word of God 
at all. Like it's in constant enmity towards God and constant hostility to God. So we're seeing this constant battle of, um, you know, a lack of faith. Yes, but the flesh just ruling over Israel, ruling them, their, their hunger, their thirst just takes over. They fall into sin because they want what they want. You know, they're, they're lusting after the flesh, so on and so forth. And then now we see this battle of um, between Israel up against the Amalekites who do represent, they're like, a I don't know how to word it, but they do represent the flesh, right? So now let's look closely at the battle. What y'all got before we, before we go on, y'all? Y'all got something? That's a good analogy of, of them representing the flesh. And how we constantly in battle and warring against our own flesh. Um, and that's why it says, what is it die? We have to die daily to the flesh. Absolutely. So that's a that's a great analogy. Elder, I had never seen, I, you know, we see this story all the time and we use this story when we're in warfare and we're praying and stuff, but I had never seen that before about the Amalekites, but God really took me on this series of, you know, different things to really point this out. I said, God, what are you trying to show me here? And when I got it, I thought it was just so profound because it really lines up with where Israel is at and it's just no coincidence. And then when we look closely at the battle, we see again, like Elder said, that rod, rod of God. Moses is holding it up and he has the two brethren on the side because Moses gets weary and helping hold up Moses's arms, right? And as Moses is holding up the authority and the power of God, then they're winning on the battlefield. But as soon as the authority and the power of God starts to slip down, they're losing on the battlefield. So we're seeing this. Um, yes, we're seeing this. So the only way to conquer the flesh is by the authority and the power of God, right? And we're seeing the... Um, What's the word I'm trying to look for, y'all? Help me. I'm, we're seeing the the two come together, the natural and the spiritual, right? Come together. Like they had to be fighting physically on the battlefield, but yet it was the power of God that was fueling them. But again, if we look at who they're fighting, the Amalekites representing the flesh, we'll see that it's only the authority, the power of God that can rule and have dominion and conquer and victory over the flesh. All right, what y'all got? Yeah, that's good. Absolutely. Um, I th we thank God for that revelation that you can only overcome, like you said, it, the wars against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. So, wow, great revelation. Absolutely. Oh, wait. And let's talk about this real quick. Let's talk about this. Now, let's go back to like you were saying, Elder, the enemy is strategic on how he will attack you. He comes in and attacks you at your vulnerable points. He attacked Israel when they least expected it. Think about it. Israel just got finished drinking from the spiritual rock. They just got finished drinking from the rock of Christ, that spiritual water. You know what I mean? And then here comes the enemy moving in when they least expect it. Isn't that, that how it goes? You know what I mean? And then think about it, y'all. Think about this. Where are they going? Remember, I told you guys to remember that. First of all, they're in Rephidim. Rephidim uh, is, uh, means place of rest, okay? So now, but they're on their way to Canaan, the promised land, to live this spirit-filled life. Canaan represents this spirit-filled life. Life, right this land flowing with milk and honey right that's what it represents but think about it so they're on their way to the promised land to live this fulfillment of this spiritual you know fulfilled life or whatever so but the flesh is consistently there after them that's why it says that they're going to continue to battle Amalek this flesh for generation to generation to generation because it's a constant battle like Elder just said and the flesh does not want you to get in the promised land the flesh does not want you to enter into that place of rest. The flesh does not want you to enter into the promises of God. That's good. I feel like that's why we have to constantly daily, like elders say, you know, it's a constant battle with our flesh and we have to die daily and dying daily. We need to continue to, um, you know, look to Christ 
everything points to Christ. We need to look to Christ, his finished work, the cross and everything. Cause um, like you said, Gwen, you know, it's our, like, again, our flesh is at a constant battle, you know, and um, it's already been conquered, won the victory uh, through Christ. And just looking at this story with the, like y'all explaining about the Amal the Amalax, I think, um, you know, with the flesh and how Edra was saying they came from behind. And then you were saying how they had just ate, they had just drank from the spiritual rod. They had just drank from Christ, you know, and it's just like us, um, you know, like it says, even when he give that parable about the, uh, the sower, I think, like the ground, when you sow seed, when the sow seeds on the ground, some of it fall on, you know, ground that is unstable or whatnot due to circumstances, things like that. So I feel like if they really knew then, just like us, if they really knew then what they were really drinking of and just kept their eyes on, you know, on God, um, you know, maybe the Amalekites wouldn't have been able to come in behind, you know, from behind or whatnot, even though they still won, because guess what? In God, we already have the victory. So like, you know, Gwen was saying, it's already the promise. It was already the promise of God to Abraham. But um, if that if that makes sense. Listen, when you get saved, all hell break loose, don't it? When you really get sold out for Christ, here come everything to challenge that spiritual awakening and authority that you have just entered into. So they drank that water that spiritual representation of Christ and, and the Holy Spirit. And here come the devil. Up, would you say, up jumped the devil. Now we're going to challenge that. Oh, you got spiritual authority? Oh, you got authority now? Oh, you got power now? Oh, you got help? Well, let me see what your help do for you. That's how the enemy do. And that's what I think we were ministering to Sister Aja earlier when we were telling her, now you walking with Christ, you, it's coming from everywhere. It's going to come from front, back, center. You know, it, it never stops because, like you said, um, sis, the flesh is always going to war against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. But we have, it's who we yield to that who is victorious in our lives. And so just know that God is greater. He is the greater, you know, but if we don't yield to the greater, then we're going to be defeated. You know, God is there, but we always say the Holy Spirit is not going to just bust in and say, all right, I'm here, I'm taking over. You got to yield to it. And, and what the Israelites failed to do was yield because they were so busy in the flesh Worried about satisfying the flesh, worrying about fleshly comforts, that they missed the whole point. They missed the whole point. And before we found Christ, or before Christ found us, or before he called us back to him, weren't we there? Following the flesh, satisfying the flesh, just thinking about fleshly things. So there is a lot of um it's a lot of metaphors in this and and it's eye opening and awakening and I just again we thank God for revelation for him breaking it down to you and him and for you sharing it with us so that we can look at it with spiritual eyes because a lot of times we read these scriptures with fleshly eyes so let us use our spiritual eyes to look and see what Christ is um, showing us. 
Praise God. Good lesson tonight. I just had a question um, about, I kept hearing um, we wrestled with like flesh and everything. And I just wanted to know when did that come into play in the Bible? Like when did flesh become a problem? Hallelujah, sis. That's a good question. Um, I just want to say this too. Sometimes there's two different references to flesh, right? And sometimes when they say flesh, they're talking about your actual physical body and like natural things, like, you know, fleshly things, natural things in the natural body, right? And then when they say the flesh, they're talking, and then, then this other way that flesh is referenced is when we refer to the, 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 sin nature so that flesh came into that sin nature that adamic sin nature came into play back in the garden when adam and eve and it says remember it says that one man meaning adam brought sin into the bloodline right to all men right because we're descendants from adam and eve man right that they that adam and eve brought sin into us and then the one man jesus came and he was able to do away with sin, one man, right? So to answer your question, sin came in in the garden through the blood of Adam and Eve. And that is the Adamic fleshly sin nature that we have. That's what we refer to as the flesh. And then there's other times where people, when they say flesh, they just talk about the actual physical body. So when it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, it's talking about we wrestle not against the physical person to person. But when we're, what we're talking about more so here is more so we the, the fight against the innate sin nature in us, if that makes sense. Hope I explained that good. So the Bible does use it in two different ways. Right. It's, it could be physical or talking about the sin nature. Yes. Mm, yeah, some people need to know. <laughs> because that could get real confusing. <laughs> but okay. Because you know what I was thinking about? I was asked that. Thank you for answering that question. But I have another question. So um, we were talking, me and you were talking about um angels and everything. And um I kept asking you, I'm like, you know, well, what happened to the women that they slept with? And like, you know, I'm like, well, when they feel like, how did, how did they die? If, you know, people say that they still alive. And I'm just like, well, where are they? And then I'm just like, um, you know, um, he was like the flesh, the flesh of them died, but their spirit lived on or whatever. And I'm like, I'm just, I have another question. So I'm like, so Satan, he used to be an actual man. Now he's a spirit, right? He's a demon, right? No, he, he was always a spirit. He, Satan, he was one of the cherubs that protected the ark. Like so when he, they fell, so when they fell from heaven, how did they sleep with the women? How did the women sleep with those the are different angels? See, they're, they're those are different angels. The, the the watchers were the ones who slept with the women because listen remember the angels had the had the ability and to to present themselves in human fleshly form to so think about Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels came and knocked on um Lot's, Lot's door and the men were banging on the door saying let us let us get to these men they were actually angels that they were trying to get at. So those, and, and there were plenty of times where the angels showed themselves as men. Gotcha. So when they came down, when and that was two hundred that came down to step with them women. It wasn't that wasn't Satan. That was a whole different set of angels. No, I know Satan did it, but I'm saying they all fell from heaven together. No, no, they, no, they didn't. This is what I'm saying. Two different sets of offenses. It's just like you live in a neighborhood and you got three gangs. Well, this gang is the one who terrorize the people and, and shake them down for money. But this gang is the ones who sell drugs. You understand? So all angels, different angels, different offenses. Satan's, Satan's, um, Satan was kicked out of heaven because he challenged God because 
he thought that he was going to be like God. So he was full of pride because he was very beautiful and he was the minister of music and everybody looked to him. And so he wanted God's glory. So him and one third, we don't know how many that is, but one third of angels were kicked out of heaven with him. So they were under him. Right. So where they go? They're, they're spirits. They were all spirits. The first right, group. Listen, right. That's that's the ones that fell with Satan. Okay. And another those group are the spirits, with... right? Those are the spirits right now that are monitoring you. Those are the spirits right now that cause people to fuss with you and, and, and challenge you and all that. Those are those that those are spirits too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you got now you got the 200 that slept with the women. They so okay, so so the first group was with Satan and the one third. And then it was another group that fell. Yeah, it was two. Yes, it was the, yes. Okay. The two, the watchers, because there are different. Listen, there are different types of angels. The watchers, which it was their job to watch well, over mankind. They are the ones who, instead of watching over mankind, decided they wanted to sleep with women. You understand? So the watchers Satan, actually was the ones that slept with the people. Right. Because Satan was uh, a cherub. He wasn't a watcher. Okay. Thank you, Miss Murray. So, yeah, it, it's it's a lot. Um, it, It's a lot, Sister Aja. Um, don't, don't stress yourself. <laughs> don't stress yourself with um, I don't I'm I don't know how to put this. Don't um it's a lot to learn about Christ. It's a lot to learn about the spirit realm. It's a lot to learn about um the things that happened before any of us were even thoughts. So a lot ex ex God to reveal to you what it is that you are searching for. He'll take you to the scriptures. He'll open up your understanding so that you'll know exactly what it is that you're seeking and he'll bring the answers to you because me trying to explain it to you, like there are different sects, just like I said, different, like think of it like different gangs. So again, Satan was a cherub. He was a different type of angel. Then you got archangels. That's yeah, like Michael. Michael. Then you got messenger angels. That's like Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Then you got the watcher angels. And those were the angels that came down and slept with women. So there's not just one type or class or group of angels. There are different types of angels. They have different jobs. And so it was the watchers that slept with the women. Satan got kicked out because of pride. And he was a cherub. So the watchers got put out before because of violation against mankind, teaching them the art of war, teaching them uh, makeup. makeup, teaching them witchcraft, teaching them all the things that are far more abominable than the sin of Adam and Eve falling in the garden. And in that process of violating mankind, they produce an offspring, which was giants, which is the Nephilim. And when the flood came, it killed off the giants. It killed off the flesh, the, the body. Flesh. Let me finish. But it killed the, off the flesh. So the demons, spirits. because they violated the heaven and they weren't permitted to go back, but they weren't permitted to be in this earth realm either. So when God, uh, when God destroyed the earth through the flood, they killed the bodies, but the spirits roams. So through sin, those same demonic, perverted spirits that were on the other side of the flood, when you continue in sin, you open yourself up to be inhabited by those spirits. Mm -hmm. So there's the Nephilim. So the Nephilim, what what did they become? Were those like considered like those gods that like they served and everything? The Nephilim is the offspring of the giants of, of the you know what i'm talking about like because like people used to say like um like the days of the week was like named after certain gods oh that's 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 a whole nother topic 
the days of the week is named after pagan gods. And if you oh, trace yeah. back every pagan god, you'll trace them back to the worship of the Nephilim. Yeah, that's what I was asking. The fallen so angels. Me. Behind all the pagan worship is the fallen angels. Right, so yeah. That's you worship the 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 whatever, the the giants, the the men of renown, Zeus, Hercules, mm -hmm. and all of that. That's just the fallen angels that they were. I know this off topic, y'all, excuse us, but then I had started like looking into them, like what well what happened to the women? And then they said that the women they had got cursed and turned into mermaids. Yeah, they, they are called marine spirits. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, it's it's a whole topic on that, but that's a whole nother teaching. That's a whole nother teaching. And yeah. I think we taught that a couple of years ago. Yeah, but that's that's but deep. You gotta you have to that's get the interesting now. A lot of times you gotta get the foundations of the Bible together first before we can go venture off into that aspect of teaching. Mm -hmm. You have to understand Genesis six and you have mm -hmm. to read the book of Enoch and deal with Genesis six. So can I ask you a question? What do you think about the book? Uh, I think it's called like Enoch or something like that. You had yeah, that's the book you need to read if you're dealing with uh, uh, Genesis six and the. So angel. you believe that that book was removed from the Bible? It was. It we, was. We have a Bible with it in there. Oh, okay. You can find it. The King James sixteen eleven. You should be able to find that on Amazon if they're still selling it. But when you go down this road, you have to be uh, spiritually. You need to be. You need to be spiritually grounded. So, what do you mean by that? You have to be knowledgeable in the Bible. You have to really know the Bible and understand. It can be the Bible, overwhelming. You know, and to, to, in order for you to pick up those books, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because the, the religion tells you that Enoch is not a. a a book that you're supposed to read. That's one of the so-called forbidden books. But when you actually sit down and read it, Enoch, you'll understand why they don't want you to read it because there's so much truth and so much revelation in the book of Enoch. Your eyes will be, um, your spiritual eyes, are, your, your spiritual eyes and ears and your understanding will be open because so much is in there. That's why they took it out. And remember the book of Revelation was taken out of the Bible at one time too. So that's why I say with all believers, you have to know church history. Right. You yeah, have I would to like the history of the church and why these books was taken out. In order to know that, you have to know history. You have to know when Constantine came in and made the gospel religion. Right. That's when all these books started disappearing and coming out. Mm -hmm. you know? So you have to understand. But you read all these books and you still believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Absolutely. He is. Absolutely. Those are not evil books. That's what that's what your enemy wants you to believe. So you have to put listen, you have to give up that religious mind. Who? And anybody who followed church and I'm, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm about to say I don't history, have one. They I'm, have to get, get rid of that <laughs> religious mind because the religious mind is a stumbling block. Yeah. So you have to go before the Lord. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. Right. We're not teachers. We're just sharing our chairs of the gospel. But the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And you have right. to, again, sacrifice your time, pray to God, ask him for the wisdom, and study your book every day, all the time. Yeah, God will reveal the things that He wants to reveal to you based on your spiritual uh, maturity. Yeah, but I just I I believe what you say. I just find it interesting to just you know have someone that I can relate to because and you know and still believe in Jesus and everything. It's just I want to be a part of your class. Well, <laughs> you have a Bible study on class. Fridays. We we on Fridays. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, we get into the deeper and heavier studies on Friday. But well, can um, you send it to me, huh? Mister Miss Marie, can you send it to me? Can y'all send it to me? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right now we're doing um the parables, so uh, oh. we got some um uh, a little deeper studies coming 
after we, you know, get through with the parables and pray, basically we're going to deal with uh, sororities, um, mm -hmm. Freemasonry and those things. Okay. Well, um, what, what, what college did you go to? Holy just, Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's it. Wow. That's okay. It. That's, see, that's a part of that religious mindset. That you think no, you because to... I hear a lot of people say like when they get like um in doctrine, in they doctrine? go through like um yeah. Listen, listen, sis. <laughs> you know who run them schools? The who? Jesuit Catholic Church. The Catholic Church runs those those schools. It's the Jesuits. They're antichrist. They uh -huh. and we know people who went to school. We know we know a very we have a personal friend who actually went to school and went through that whole thing and the things that he told us that how they taught them how not to teach the whole truth first of all they don't teach them the whole truth they teach them how to open up church but they teach them how to um keep people under witchcraft through um control so they're not mm -hmm. even really learning the truth you know the holy spirit is the teacher remember that right okay. right right and then you only Ooh. go you're only going to know as much as you're willing to sacrifice yourself and your time. Right. He, who he called, he justified, he equips, and he glorifies. Yeah, so, when I hear stuff like this, I just get nervous, like, in my spirit. Like, I get nervous. I get kind of, I get nervous, y'all. <laughs> scared to exposure, you know? I yeah. feel like a little groundhog, like I peep my head out to get like information and understand everything because I like to do that because like I go right back underground because I don't know what's going to come you know yeah, that's, that's why you have to ask the Holy Spirit yes. to, to teach you and to lead you there's nothing to fear there's nothing scary about Christ there's nothing no, scary nothing about the truth but you have to be guided by the Holy Spirit you but I'm the only person that went through this stage like of like no. having fear in the beginning no, absolutely not. Everybody had at, at a point where they were scared. Scared. It was a time where I was scared to read the book of Revelation. Scared me to death. <laughs> scared me to death. But, you know, as you grow into spiritual maturity and you allow Christ to lead you, then, you know, the, he see, brings a peace. But he opens up these books to you. Yeah. You know, being you like a, we're like children. You know, he only gives us but so much based on what we can spiritually handle. Right. He grows us. So when you hear people talking and seem so knowledgeable, I'm st I'm still learning. You know, it's so much in this Bible to understand and to learn. It's crazy to think that you can know this Bible, You'll know it all. Because it's a living word and it's a word that you need to be spiritually fed off of, it changes. Because if you could just read and go through it one time, then it wouldn't be a living word. It'd just be the word. But it's a living word, so you'll never know it. When you think you know it, you'll read that same passage and get another spiritual understanding. And you say, I thought I knew this. No, you you ain't going to never know it, know it. Because That's it lives. It, it brings revelation. It That's brings true. revelation you every time read, you read it. You can read the same scripture three different times and get three different revelations. Evangelist Gwen did... The, the parable, the pearl, the pearl Friday. Yeah. She read it and the Holy Spirit showed her some things. And when she read it and shared it, it just took on a whole different relevant uh, revelation. Yeah. And I read it. I read it all the time. I read this word all the time. That's why Bible studies are beautiful. Because the Holy Spirit is always teaching. And through the sharing, it opens up new revelation to the ones who have already read it. And I was blessed uh, Friday when Gwen did the flip side. Whoa. Okay. And it just connect, start connecting uh, what you already know about the Bible and what was already said in scripture. It's just start connecting all up again. So it's, it's a process. You know, we like to know it all real fast, but no, we have to go how the Holy Spirit leads us. And yeah. he'll, he'll send people our way to help us, 
But our true reliance is is on the Holy Spirit. You got to be willing to put the time in. You have to study all the time. That's what I do. I'll study all the time yeah. because that's my life. That's how he. So, is. so do y'all? So what y'all saying is that the more you you actually live and walk with God. The revelations, the revelations from the word will continue to change. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's a living word. Absolutely. Yeah. It grows just like, you know, you put a baby on milk, he need that milk to live. And eventually yeah. you start to go to solid food. Eventually you start to go to meat. But that baby grows into a man and he never stopped eating. He always right. got to eat to live. So we had a spiritual appetite that needs to be fed all the time so we always have to feed off the word that's the bread of life right not this life but everlasting life all right so i tell you what how much tv do you watch i don't watch tv okay good you're in a good spot how much time are you spend in the word um, Tuesday, Tuesday, Sunday, whenever I'm crying and, uh, <laughs> not, not, not like I don't study is what I'm saying. I don't study. So i tell you what, read the word, meditate on the word, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. Because every time you study word and you read the word and you set aside time for the word, you actually enter into intimacy with God. Right. And when you make an effort to do that, you give the Holy Spirit latitude within you to move you. You know, Holy Spirit don't move ahead of you. It only moves based on the time you're willing to surrender to it. So y'all think mermaids real? Sirens are real. Yes, honey. But um, not in yes. the physical sense. Right, and it's no in the spiritual, in the spiritual sense, yes. sense. In the physical sense, no. Right. That's like fantasy. In the spiritual sense, just like the spirit of Jezebel. It's there. They, remember, we're spiritual beings. So they used to be alive, but they don't live anymore. This they have always been mystical. Right. They're spirits. They just spirits. spirits. They call marine spirits. Right. So why are people saying that they feel like they find mermaids and stuff? Really? First of all, we don't know what's in the ocean because nobody's ever been to the bottom of the ocean because it's too vast. So just like they've never been to the moon. So this is why this is where spiritual discernment comes in. Mm -hmm. 